Got All right, it. you're good. Oh, oh. Got it, got it. yeah. You just have to. I think you just have to say "got it," and then you'll be ready to go. Okay. Okay, I got, got the got it. it. Now I got it. See, I said I got it. I didn't get it. Now I got it. <laughs> it's up to me to get it. Yeah. Well, I am Alan, uh, and uh, I'm a line president of about uh, 10 or 11 years. Uh, astronomy is a long time passion of mine since I was a teenager. Uh, and recently we have jammed up some um, astronomy interest uh, in, the, in the area, not restricted to mine residents in the world, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. But anyhow, uh, what we're going to do tonight is, is really tell you about light pollution and some of its deleterious effects. Uh, most of that is in the fieldhouse. Um, I'm sort of just uh, sort of a mechanician who really likes to see the night sky, and they're obviously related to each other. So the front end of the presentation will be, be me maybe showing you some of the table states, or at least you know, my viewpoint of the table states, which is whether or not we can see out there to the world. And, um, Let's see. Does this work? It does. <laughs> um, so uh, people have been looking up to the night sky since forever. It's a fascination for centuries and centuries and centuries. In fact, Lots of the star names that are in this today come from civilizations of long ago. Uh, and um, one of my affiliations is the Lion Land Trust. In fact, it's underneath the umbrella of the Lion Land Trust that I'm doing the public and some of the sessions. And uh, so, in addition to all the acreage and all the normal things that you would expect the Land Trust to do, striding in dark skies is now right there in the drop down. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm so passionate about it. We have this thing called the 52 Trail Challenge in the in the land trust, and we do all the 52 trails. I don't know if you get a T-shirt or a lot of Mercedes Benz. You get something. And uh, I convinced my fellow board members to name the observatory the Trail 53 Observatory. That's the 53rd trail. It's part of the natural world we live in, which is that sky right there. Um. And um, to me, uh, the night sky is this amazing portal, like, like being in a submarine and having a window. I mean, we all have this portal to the universe. It's right out there. Uh, this is uh, actually taken at our dark sky site in line, taken by one of our astronomy cohorts. But the thing is, the sky is getting really terrible. Uh, this is a graphic representation of the light pollution and now light that is going to broadcast like everything uh, in our country. And if you just look from the Mississippi, you know, halfway across the country over, it's just wiped out and coast to coast, just totally wiped out. All of those lights. I mean, you can name the cities from those lights. Except down here, we are kind of less because we are in this little dark hole as compared to that, blotted out from Florida all the way to Maine, we are in this precious black hole here um, uh, in, in our area, and we take advantage of that. Uh, the right side would be what you know, blow up from the page before. The left side is an actual satellite image. We really are in this dark spot. And because of that, again, this is in the, the dark sky site. Uh, this band that in front of you there that slants up to the left, that is the Milky Way. For those people who are not sure, that is the Milky Way, slightly enhanced because it's a photograph, not naked eye. Um, but uh, this is the Milky Way, and you can even see these little details that you can see in here are all basically telltale signs that we are in good, unique dark sky. Where is the North Star? Well, in, in this picture, uh, if we were standing here in the field with the truck looking at that, we would turn around 180 degrees and the next star would be there. <laughs> so it's this looking south. Um, but uh, the point I, I also want to make here is all this bright glow that's out there. So this is all wonderful stuff. This is not such wonderful stuff that I'm going to. It's, 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 so among all the things that we should talk about, one of the things is the way it wipes out our view to the to the to the universe. 
Now, my take on it is besides sharing, observing, just for the sake of observing, I, I just like people to be exposed to it. So some of the things that we do, for instance, we've been to the to the Lyme and Old Lyme Scouts uh, down at Camp Clare. Uh, and we've had them to the observatory and give them some exposure to telescopes in the night sky. Uh, we also are in the, in the schools. Uh, we uh, two times have gone into the Lyme or Lyme Consolidated School and showed the kids some things on a rainy day indoors. And then just last week, outdoors, we're actually using golf balls to help them understand how the sun, what the sun does to this golf ball is the same thing it's doing to the moon. And that's why the moon's that shape. And in fact, if you put the golf ball between you and the sun, you know, you're not really seeing it. It's darker than if you go like this, and then it's light, and that's what the moon is doing going around us. The moon's the first floor of the moon, it's over. And you see the kids do what you just did. And like, oh, that makes sense. And uh, so, so we take, you know, do those road shows, but bringing it home, uh, we also have this observatory. Uh, at that dark sky site. So the pictures before at night were taken nearby to this building right there. We do monthly sessions open to the public. So the wine land trust website. Uh, but everybody is welcome to go. You don't have to be a wine resident. You don't have to be a member of the wine land trust. We get people from Salem. We've had people from Southbury even come up here. Uh, the site uh, is. Um, who cares? But uh, somebody cared at some point to put that on a map. But the, you know, it, 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 uh, this is like Mount Archer Road right up here, Brush Hill Road, if you're familiar with that. Oh, and this is John Clear Town. And the thing is right in there, just to give you a little bit of an idea. That's what it looks like at night. I said all these things already about uh, the Lion Land Trust site, but that's what it looks like at night. And notice little red lights. There's red lights everywhere because white lights make your pupils narrow reaction. And after you take away the white light, it gives a lot of other pupils to open back up. And in the meantime, you're not seeing all the faint objects up in the sky. Uh, that's one of the telescopes. That's a telescope inside the observatory, which I call beast because <laughs> it is a beast. It's large. It's about the size of your body mm -hmm. It's about this long. It's about 14 inches around, it does a super job. There's a whole bunch of telescopes around, and people bounce from scope to scope. One of the things that people do with these telescopes is take pictures of these very faint objects. So, so this is something you would not be able to see looking through the telescope. You would see this because you use photographic equipment, and we're in these dark skies, and we get these amazing results. Parag is one of uh, I call them cohorts, and we have a dozen people who are at site who know astronomy very well and have telescopes and astrophotography equipment and love talking about it. Um, here's an idea of some of the things that you might see looking in the telescope, and the big difference is that when you take a picture, the color comes out. When you look with your naked eye, there's not enough light at night to stimulate cones in your eye and the cones that would be the color. So only the rods lighting up. So you sort, you sort of see it like that. But just great pleasure, believe me, in finding something that's wondrous and 100,000 or a million or 3 million light years away. It's kind of a neat feeling. Um, and uh, a couple other uh, sample photographs. Uh, and, and these things would not really be possible if we were in truly like blue skies here. I'll show you that dark hole that we are in. Um, uh, this is a little left and right. The joy of finding is this galaxy, which exists in the constellation triangulum. And if you look at the telescope, something like the one on the left, you might not really see quite as much of what is telltale that there's spiral arms in there. You take a picture of the same thing and you start bringing out all of the, all of the uh, contrast. Now, this is uh, interesting. This is the Andromeda Galaxy. If you don't have a galaxy, it's a shoot. Andromeda Galaxy is our closest galaxy neighbor. We're in the Milky Way Galaxy, but the we exist. The Andromeda Galaxy is 3 million light years away, but it's the closest one to us, which means that that picture, which was taken last year, uh, it took, it's been 3 million one years <laughs> since that light came to us here on the Earth. Wonderful picture by Roger, uh, and uh, he took it at the Dark Sky site. Now, I took a picture of the Adrenaline Galaxy a few years ago. Um, 
and a light blue place, the last place that I lived. And that's the difference. Um, and the reason that those, those pink lines are there is because if you see this little shape of stars, just want you to see that's that right there. And this little shape of stars, I want you to see that's that right there. And there's this little sort of a uh, bow. That's that little bow there. And this is that. So, in other words, I wanted to show you that's the same exact spot in the sky. What it looks like with this light polluted. Those people, me over there at that time, will never get to see this, but this is what's there. And it's the light pollution that's blocking it out. Um, and then that sky glow right there. Well, that sky glow, that's Deep River in essence. So you would ask me, where's the North Star? Where's the North Star? So this, this was facing south and north. So I was behind us. This is facing south. And I actually used Google Earth to draw a line from the top of my, where my observatory is, up past where I knew you can just barely see it. This actually my driveway in my house is there. And I drew a line and blurred like right? I was definitely looking in this direction. And I drew it that line out. It's deep in the nest. It's all their lights and at night. And, and when you're out there in the middle of the night and you've been out there for a bunch of time and your eye is dark and dented, then something like that really gives off a big flow. This is a picture that I grabbed it, but I'm telling you, when you stand there, you can tell the difference when you look around 360 degrees. It's light there, then it's dark, it's dark, and then it gets light again because you look in a sail and then you love it, and then it gets dark the rest of the rain around. So to me, that's a table, one of the table stakes. There's a lot of others that we should going to touch upon. Uh, but what we have here is really a pressure portal to the rest of the universe. We, you know, we live on we live here in Lyme and Old Lyme, and we live here in New London County, in the state of Connecticut, on the planet Earth, but there's a universe out there. And once we make that go away, it's just gone. So light pollution is to me a big deal. Um, and hopefully we will convince you that it's a big deal to show you some things that are happening around us that we really can make a difference with without tremendous effort just for fun. So all that gets recorded someplace, just my mind my adjust, everything else will flow. Now with that, I am going to turn over to Misha, who is really going to talk more technicalities about much bigger effects than just looking up at the sky and the things that cause it and what we can do about it. Thank you all. That was great. And a really important reminder of what the night sky means to us, not just from the point of view of science, but even culturally in the history of humanity. You know, pretty much always we've had the night sky to look at. It's only in the last hundred years that most humans have been denied the ability to see these things. In the past, cultures evolved, and art evolved, and constantly being able to see all these things, the Milky Way in the night sky. And it's important um, on that level, as well as on the physiological level, which I'll get into. Um, but just to introduce myself a little further, uh, I'm Misha. I'm uh, by day an architect at Center Brook Architects, uh, designing buildings, many of which are around here. And... Uh, along the river and uh, have to think about night lighting. Um, by evenings, uh, once a month, I'm also a commissioner for Essex on the Gateway Commission. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of what the Gateway Commission is or what it does, uh, I invite you to check out that poster and some brochures that we have uh, in the back. Um, the nutshell summary is it was created 50 years ago, actually, this year, um, by the state legislature in response to concerns about development in the Connecticut River Valley. So there are eight member towns that are at the mouth of the Connecticut River, and these eight towns have signed into a compact to basically adopt gateway standards into their zoning regulations. So we, as uh, a committee that includes two uh, member representatives from each town, as well as representatives uh, from local planning organizations and the uh, and deep um, state uh, Environmental Protection Agency, um, we all meet and we figure out what are the right standards to protect this precious resource that we have, which is the mouth of the Connecticut River, which is really one of the only undeveloped estuaries that we have on the East Coast. It's pretty miraculous that here we are, you know, not just in this huge swath of light pollution stretching from Virginia to, to Boston, um, but also, you know, endless development and endless paving. And here we are in this amazing place that is a, a hole for dark skies and also this incredible ecological resource. So our task is to figure out how to set rules for development um, that will be incorporated into each town's zoning um, that try and protect this resource. So 
Recently, one of the things we've been looking at is light pollution because it's something that has not been addressed in our standards to date. We look at a density of development, we look at the height of buildings, we look at how much pervious paving is there, uh, we make sure that riparian buffers are protected. Um, those things are all in the gateway standards. Lighting is not yet, but it's it's coming. So I'll get to that uh, shortly. Uh, but that's sort of the impetus was the Gateway Commission really trying to figure out what can we do about light pollution? Why is it a problem? And so this presentation I'm going to give you now was developed specifically for the Connecticut River, um, which is why I'm going to talk a lot about estuaries and water bodies, because as the Gateway Commission, um, that's really our, our primary concern is, you know, the, the, the strip of land along the river and both sides of the river is what our purview um, is. So, um, just as a teaser, here's an image that looks a lot like Alan's, but without excess light pollution. This is the Connecticut River, but not here. Uh, this is all the way up uh, at Dartmouth. So up there, a lot less light pollution, and you can really see the Milky Way. Imagine if we could go out in the river right here and see this. That'd be pretty special. Um, and it is possible with some of the things I'm going to talk about. Uh, so the plan for the rest of the presentation here uh, is I'm going to talk specifically about some of the deleterious effects of light pollution on the river, on river ecosystems, on human health. Uh, then I'm going to talk about specific things that we can do as homeowners, as business owners, uh, to limit our contribution to this problem. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Gateway has done to try and incorporate this into standards and guidelines for development. So that's the game plan. Um, but I'd, I'll start with um, this view. This is on the cove that I live on in Essex, Falls River Cove. Um, this is a neighbor who I, I suppose, um, and I, I'm gonna guess didn't have bad intentions. They probably went to Lowe's and found a bunch of floodlights and they wanted lighting. So they put a bunch of floodlights and now the entire cove is flooded with light. Um, you know, these lights aren't just lighting this person's property. They light this entire lawn. They reflect in the water. And this happens pretty much all night long. Um, this is an example of property that could be easily improved with a, you know, a few cutoff fixtures and maybe modulating lights, but this is totally normal right now. Uh, people put these lights up, they're not really aware of what the problem is, they're sold in stores without really anybody knowing why they might be a problem. And then when they're installed, the result is that you can go kayaking on a cove of Connecticut River at dusk and get blinded and not be, even be able to see the reeds um, or the blackbirds in the reeds because all you see is, is this really excessive light. So another image, a little zoom in um, of um, what you guys have already seen, but specifically focusing on the gateway zone of the river. Uh, you can see those are the, those awful lights in Essex and Deep River that mess up the view from the observatory up here in Lyme. Um, but you can see, you know, this is really the, the hole of the donut here, uh, where there is as much light pollution, and then, you know, ringing around uh, Alan's lovely observatory site, we have a lot of, um, a lot of this light streaming out. So what does this actually do in the river? Um, so a bit of a deep dive here into uh, estuary biology. So the cycle of plankton um, and microorganisms in the water is actually very important uh, because these little plankton eat algae. And they eat algae primarily at those times that they can't be seen by larger predators. So during the nighttime, when there isn't a full moon, um, I love the golf ball, by the way. It's like a whole new way of visualizing the moon cycle. Um, so when there isn't a full moon and you know fish and other predators can't see these plankton, they go right up to the surface and they feed. Um, and this is called the dial migration cycle. It happens in the ocean, it happens in rivers, it happens in ponds, um, and it happens daily, right? During the day, they sink to the bottom. At night, they go up. On, day, on nights that there's the moon, they don't go nearly as high up. On nights there is no moon, they go all the way up. And this is really important to the cycling of resources in the water body. What happens with light pollution? So this is a diagram that's, uh, I suppose, developed for an ocean setting, because this is, I guess, like a deep sea fishing boat that's using light. But it's the same exact idea. You know, if you're shining uh, water off of a bridge into the river, um, same thing. The plankton think that it is the middle of the day, and they don't dare go up to the surface. So all that migration and that cycling um, doesn't actually happen. And you can see here, you know, depending on how bright that is, oftentimes these lights are brighter than the moon and the color temperature is also higher than the moon. And so it really feels like the sun. Um, so if, you know, on a day of the full moon, they would still go up a little bit, you know, with the constant light shining on them, they're really gonna stay down there. Um, moving into somewhat bigger creatures, uh, there's been a lot of interesting work looking at the effects of um, Allen. 
uh, no offense to uh, my co-presenter here. Um, Alan stands for artificial lighting at night. And it's just become, a, you know. <laughs> uh, so when exposed to Alan, um, <laughs> these uh, spring peepers are our favorite first signs of spring that we heard a few months ago. Um, the tadpoles actually come out darker, which is interesting. And not all these mechanisms are fully understood, um, but a lot of these experiments they've done, you know, capturing peepers, putting them in a lab, exposing them to light 24 hours um, a day and sort of seeing what happens in development. Um, you know, it affects the size, it affects other aspects of physiology. There's not necessarily a conclusive thing we can say about all amphibians, um, but certainly it affects their physiology. It also affects mating. Um, as we know from hearing the wonderful frogs in the springtime, they rely on sound to find each other, but they need the cover of darkness so that they can hear each other, but not be seen by predators. And when there's a lot of lighting, predators have a much easier time finding the frogs. So they have to hide, they have to maybe sing louder, exert more energy. Um, so there's ongoing study about that. Um, some interesting studies in particular about the South American frog, the Tungara. There's been a lot of interesting work on how um, urban night lighting affects their breeding. Um, they found that the males actually have totally different behaviors in urban settings. Um, and then what does this do with a larger ecosystem? I think some of these things are probably obvious to those of us who uh, have lights that attract a lot of insects during the summer. Um, you can imagine that if you have a river ecosystem without artificial lighting, the insects are probably spread pretty evenly out over the water or following wind currents or thermal gradients, uh, which means that fish can feed on those insects and then you know, the whole ecosystem can cycle through. Uh, when you have lights that are along the water, then insects get attracted to those lights. Those insects then are staying away from places where they could be eaten by the fish um, and by you know, the natural cycle of predation. Um, it changes things. Perhaps bats that uh, have adapted to swoop around lights might have a better time, uh, but it certainly uh, means a change in the ecology. Uh, it also means that smaller fish um, in addition to those plankton that I talked about with the dial migration, they're also hiding more. So uh, again, this is a, during the day, um, it's quite normal for the big fish to be out and the small fish to be hiding. But at night, usually we, there's a more general uh, random distribution of, of all the aquatic life. Whereas as soon as you start shining light in that water, things revert back to daytime um, as if it were the middle of the day again. And uh, there are lots of really interesting studies. This one's from Ecosphere. Uh, so if you're really interested in this, I encourage you to check them out. Um, you know, some are studies that are done uh, sort of with natural experiments, and some are lab experiments where they expose, uh, you know, artificial environments to this Allen um, <laughs> and see what happens. Um, and uh, it's also been proven that there's a pretty strong effect on migrating fish um, from lights off of bridges in particular. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about what these degrees Kelvin mean, but essentially uh, lights come in different color temperatures. And the higher um, the degrees Kelvin, uh, the sort of brighter and bluer the light is. And the, uh, the colder the temperature, actually, the warmer the light color is. It's a little bit counterintuitive. But essentially, think of a low color temperature as a traditional incandescent light bulb or candle flame. It's sort of warm. It's a lot more like a sunset glow. Um, whereas anything in the spectrum of really, really high intensity, high temperature light is going to be this sort of strong fluorescent blue light. And it turns out that strong fluorescent blue light is what affects uh, organisms the most. That's what they perceive the most to be like noontime, you know, strong sun, and, and their bodies react that way. Um, and so at night, um, which is when a lot of anadromous fish migrate through our waterways, they're very easily distracted by high color temperature light. Um, there was actually an entire run of migratory salmon that was decimated uh, by lighting off of a bridge in Redding, California. If any of you are familiar with the Sundial Bridge by Santiago Calatrava, it's a really cool uh, suspended bridge. Um, been in a lot of publicity. And of course, they light it up at night because it looks really cool. Um, and thankfully, over the last few years, they've uh, figured out a way to cap those lights and keep them from shining into the water. Uh, and they've restored that salmon run. But it's amazing how that one bridge um, had such a huge effect. All the juvenile salmon, um, after they spawn, are so confused, they don't make it to the ocean because they're just circling around at night under this, this light. It's like this thing that mesmerizes them. Um, similar thing happens to birds. Uh, birds are also mesmerized by bright lights, uh, and migration um, suffers quite a bit as a result of this. So um, many of you may have seen the coverage of this. This is the uh, tribute in light um, at the site of the September 11th attacks. Um, this is when they basically project the shapes of the Twin Towers 
up into the night sky, super powerful beams. Um, and you know, a few years after they started doing this, bird activists were infuriated and they, they pointed at the data and said, look, you're killing all these birds because this is September 11th, it's the height of fall migration when all the birds in the Atlantic flyway are going down to the tip of Manhattan and they're trying to make their way south. And then they run into these columns of light and they're dazed and confused. And a lot of them start you know, crashing into buildings, crashing into each other. Um, and it's pretty incredible. So a few years ago, uh, thanks to the pressure from Audubon, uh, the organizers of the tribute actually agreed to uh, basically suspend the lights for a number of minutes until bird counters, and I believe they had bird counters, uh, volunteers there all night um, checking on the number of birds. And then when there are too many birds in the sky, they shut the lights off for half an hour and they turn them back on. So you can see here, um, when the lights are off, uh, this is a, a radar view of the birds. There are 500 birds within half a kilometer of, of the lights. And then this is 2.32 a.m., oh, sorry, 2.12 a.m. And then 20 minutes later, they've turned on the lights and now there are 15,700 birds. So these lights are like a beacon um, to the birds. They, they fly right toward it. And these dots in this image are individual birds. So all those 15,000 birds are suspended in the air um, over the site of the World Trade Center. Um, and you know, this is probably the biggest scale version of this that I've seen because the lights are so powerful, but it happens all the time, whether we're talking about um, stadium lighting that's misdirected, you know, car dealerships that have lights flashing, and all these things can confuse migratory birds um, as well as other animals. And in case we think we are immune to this, we're not, um, especially again, when you have that really high Kelvin temperature blue light that affects our bodies as well, because it's telling our bodies it's the middle of the day, um, even though it might be midnight. Um, so that messes up our circadian rhythms, it messes up our melatonin production, um, and can result in all sorts of issues, poor sleep quality, which can then lead to other physiological issues. There have been a lot of studies that have come out recently that have linked um, exposure to a lot of Allen uh, <laughs> to uh, cancer, obesity, and neurodegeneration. Oh, no. Um, but this, this is really real. You know, we can't divorce ourselves from the natural environment. In the same way that these lights are affecting all of our fellow creatures, you know, we're being affected by them as well. Um, and it's wasteful. Um, this is a study that was put together by the International Dark Sky Association, where they estimate that about 50 million tons of carbon dioxide are emitted every year for lighting that is unnecessary. So this isn't talking about lighting for safety or for transportation or things that are needed. This is just excess light that's cast off you know, into the sky for no good reason. Um, that's a lot of carbon dioxide. It's a lot of energy that we could be using for something much more productive. Um, so what are some solutions? So the first thing is recognizing that there's a difference between what actually needs to be lit and what ends up getting lit most of the time when we put lighting up outside at night. So in this case, you know, you have a, a street lamp and you're just trying to light the sidewalk so that people don't trip as they're walking at night. Uh, what you end up doing, uh, if you don't shield this properly, is direct glare into people's eyes, uh, light trespassing into people's windows when they're trying to sleep, and then that light getting reflected and um, going up into the sky. And if there's a lot of cloud cover, then that bounces quite a number of times, and you get what you often see in, when you're in a city at night, which is you know pretty much a glowing sky if they're illuminated. Uh, but there are some easy fixes to this. So... You know, if we take the standard sort of heritage gas lamp and upgrade that a little bit with a cap, you know, it's already better. We're not emitting light directly into the sky. Uh, if we just have it go at 180 degrees and below, you know, that's half of that light that um, isn't getting wasted. I mean, if you still have a light bulb that's omnidirectional, that's kind of wasteful because you're just shining light at a cap. So hopefully you can figure out a way to put in LEDs that are directional and not waste that light. But at least you're not shining it up where it's not needed. Um, and the best practice is just to illuminate what you really need to see, because at the end of the day, what is lighting for? It's, it's for uh, security and safety at night so that we see where we're walking, we see where we're going. Um, and if we're illuminating something else, that's actually distracting. Uh, so shielding is something that I would recommend to my neighbor on the cove there. Um, you know, if, if he wants to see his lawn at night, that's, that's totally on him. Uh, but it's quite easy to put a shield on that floodlight and instead of having a 180 degree field, you know, you can have a 90 degree field and just shine it onto your property. And uh, good lights, not just good fences, I think, uh, make good neighbors so that we're not angry at night and we have lights shining into our windows. 
Uh, so there is a naughty, na naughty list and a nice list that's put out by the International Dark Sky Association. Um, they're just a really fantastic organization. If you go to their website, they have a lot of resources on light pollution, good lighting fixtures. Uh, they even have a model ordinance for towns and organizations to adopt. So they're just really fantastic. And this is actually a page that is part of their model lighting ordinance. Uh, that has been adopted by Westbrook. So the town of Westbrook actually has this image in their zoning regulations. Um, and a, lo a lot of towns will just drop it in. Uh, because it's, it's just a really good guide to you know what, what's good and what isn't. So you know these old gas lamp style fixtures, as, as I showed, most of the light they're emitting is not useful. Uh, you can have similar shape fixtures, but if you put the LED lights just in the tops, so they're shining down, uh, you can use you know, so much less energy and actually illuminate what you need to illuminate. So here's an example. Um, I have a client who's building something on the water, actually. Um, and she really loved the look of this lamp. She was like, I, I really want to get this lamp. It looks nautical. It's going to make my house feel, you know, related to the water. Um, can we just put this on the outside of my house facing the river? And I said, well, do you really want people on boats in the summer to be going down the river at night and, and being blinded by these naked light bulbs? Or would you rather have this really nice indirect light that's just gently illuminating your house? Um, and thankfully, I was able to convince her to go go with this light. Um, and I think in most cases, you know, it's not quite the same design. I get it. Um, I would have loved for this manufacturer to just change this to a yeah. This is like a fake. It's an LED light bulb that's made to look like a fake incandescent because this is the rage these days. Something I don't quite understand, but. Um, I wish this manufacturer would just make a dark sky version because a lot of manufacturers do. But in most cases, when you're looking for lighting for your house, for your business, uh, for a, a street lamp, there's probably a version that looks very similar, but that has a different design where the lighting never shines into your eyes. And I'm sure her neighbors will be very grateful to her for not putting this light up. So this is just a little bit of a better explanation of what I mentioned earlier with the fish slide about um, degrees Kelvin. So during the middle of the day, uh, the sunlight, when it's directly overhead in the summer, is you know quite hot, um, around 6,000 degrees Kelvin. And so that's what our body reacts to. Uh, but in the evening, it's closer to 2,700 degrees Kelvin. So uh, when we are looking at an old incandescent style light, um, that's going to be closer to this. Uh, but you know, a really fluorescent light fixture, even some of the early LEDs that first came out were really, really bright. And everybody here has probably noticed LEDs have come a really long way. You can now get LEDs um, you know, all the way down uh, to very, very uh, low Kelvin temperatures that feel a lot like a candle glow. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of LEDs that are sold at hardware stores today are still in the 5,000 Kelvin range. And, and they're marketed as, you know, letting you see everything at night, which I suppose if you are driving in your car and you, you want to turn on your far lights, you might want to have that color temperature. But generally speaking, there's really no need for it. And it also feels rather alien. I mean, any of us who have been in a hospital with fluorescent lighting, and you know, it doesn't doesn't feel cozy at all. Um, so, um, oh, and the other thing that um, you might be familiar with is high pressure and low pressure sodium lights. They were very popular, maybe in the last few decades in, you know, large supermarket parking lots, they cast a very orange glow. So if you've ever been in a parking lot where everything looks orange, that's what those are. They are energy efficient. And um, they're also pretty great from the light pollution perspective because they're, they're very low temperature and don't cast a lot of sky glow. Um, they're being replaced these days by LEDs. And that's one of the important things is as we're doing that to make sure we're keeping the LEDs low color temperature. Um, because the high pressure sodium lamps were great in their day, you know, 30 years ago when they came out because they were so much more energy efficient than incandescents were. Um, now LEDs have totally changed the whole equation for lighting, right? Before we'd spend five to 10 times more energy on lighting. And now we can get the same amount of illumination. In fact, a lot of people are installing light fixtures that are way more bright, and way more powerful, but they use less energy than the old ones did. Um, that's one of the things we have to battle um, because a lot of homeowners say, oh, well, lighting is so cheap. I can just install LEDs under every tree and uplight every tree on my property and you know, cast light out of every window and flood the whole property. Um, and, and now you can do it without it costing you very much. Um, even though electricity is expensive, LEDs are really cheap to operate. So um, the good news is that if you know your lighting facts, when you go next time to buy a new light bulb or install a new fixture, you can actually usually find all this information out 
um, on the label. So usually you'll have a degrees Kelvin, um, you know, ranging from Warden to cool, and you, you want to stay sort of below 3000, ideally for outdoor lighting. Um, it'll give you the energy cost and it'll also give you the brightness in lumens. Um, and the Dark Sky Association also has some really good guides on what amount of lumens is appropriate um, by lighting zone. So to sum up sort of what you can do, um, I, I love the way the Dark Sky Association put this. I can put it better myself. So I'm just gonna let you see there. There are four tips. One, minimizing the amount of illumination. So don't use more, don't put out more lumens than you actually need. If all you're doing is lighting a garden path, don't put a giant floodlight on it. Uh, minimize the area of illumination. So shine light only on what is actually needed. Uh, minimize the duration. So put switches or timers or dimmers on your lights so that they're not shining all night. They're only shining when a car is driving past, when someone is in your driveway. Um, and then finally, color temperature below 3000 Kelvin. So these are kind of the four big things that we can all do. And I think all of us can think of lights on our houses that we could really quickly and easily switch out um, to comply with these tips. Um, again, for those of you who are more visual learners, um, I like this version as well. So there's been a, a lot of questions about lighting, crime, and safety. Uh, and the Dark Sky Association also has a lot of good resources about this on their website. So I invite you to uh, check that out. But this is, uh, I don't have an embedded video in here, but this is a video they have on their website that you can look at of uh, uh, the ambush, a crime happening in full glare, uh, bright light. Uh, their, their point here is that when you have a lot of glare from these naked light bulbs, it's actually harder to see crimes happening. Um, so we are gonna do a little demonstration uh, here where uh, I'm just gonna turn this great light on. Is this the brightest it goes? All right. Yeah. All right. So uh, Alan, do you wanna? Here. <laughs> I have this, this wallet just sticking out of my, my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> now we can try that again with a shield that's shining directly in the light, you know, around me and on the ground. So, yeah, depending on what it is that you want to illuminate. Of course, I'm stealing it from you, am I? Okay, it's your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> The point being, hopefully, that with this light in your eyes, it's light, but it's hard to see anything behind. Or if it was up in front of your shirt, it'd probably be hard to see all of that. But if we had to light the area, we can light the area, and you can see him perfectly fine. And you know, we've all experienced it sometimes with eye beams, but sometimes it's very hard to see. Uh, uh, is it called public hall up in line on one fifty six? That old. Uh, the, that old building, and they have a light that goes on in the back parking lot. It's motion detector. And when that light went on, for me, the first time, it was so bright that really for like 10 or 15 seconds, I really couldn't see any when it flashed on. Even though the ground was all lit up, it was just so overdone. And I think that's the point. Yeah, and can you imagine I'm the entry door to your house? It's the same thing, right? If I have a, a light that's over the door like this, then someone can sneak in here pretty easily. Whereas if the light is shining here and the light isn't, you know, coming out beyond a few feet, then as you approach the house, you have a very clear view of the whole door area. And this is something simple that, that we can all do. Uh, but unfortunately, it's still quite common for people to put flood right over their doors that don't even illuminate the door area itself. So, you know, the very entrance to your house, you're trying to protect is dark and you're illuminating the lawn outside, which, um, depending on what angle you're looking from, may or may not be um, useful. So I apologize for how pixelated this is because I stole this from someone else's presentation, but this is a good example of how, you know, there are some very high light intensity settings that we, we do have and have to have, such as uh, sports games at night, but even those can be fully shielded. So there are versions of lights that, you know, don't emit anything outside of this these 90 degrees, and it helps a lot. Um, obviously, some birds will still be confused, but at least they're not all going to, you know, fly in a column in the sky and crash into each other uh, as they would with possibly, you know, these lights that are just going all over the place. So I mentioned the model lighting ordinance, uh, which is put out again by the Dark Sky Association 
together with the uh, IES, the Illuminating Engineering Society. Um, and this is a fantastic document uh, for anybody who is you know, interested in this on a, on a political level, how to get their town to um, you know, start to get a handle on this. Um, they have, for example, um, suggested lumen allowances by zone. So what they do is just like when you zone a town for density, um, they have different zones for um, LZ zero is like a very rural zone, kind of like where Allen's Observatory is, um, or maybe even darker, um, you know, all the way up through the more urban, um, more densely developed zones. And so for each of these zones, they basically have a lighting allowance. And in towns that get very serious about this ordinance, this is part of your building permit. You would basically submit to the town, here are all the lumens I'm going to put in, and you know, here's my fully shielded fixture a cut sheet, and the town reviews it and says, okay, you're in compliance. Um, as you can imagine, this requires quite a bit of legwork on the town's part. So uh, this is quite a lift for towns to adopt. Um, Sustainable Connecticut, which is a, a program that's been around for a few years now to sort of accredit towns in Connecticut, gives a quite a number of points for towns that do adopt this. So there have been some towns in Connecticut, as I mentioned, Westbrook being one of them that have used this and adopted it um, as an ordinance. But we at Gateway, um, you know, we have eight member towns that are um, along the river. Uh, we knew that we couldn't get all of our towns to do something like this, nor would it really be within our purview as the Gateway Commission to um, to get towns to enforce something like this. But we did want to find some way to start a conversation about light pollution to get it at least into town zoning standards. So what we ended up doing is saying we're going to start by getting all the towns along the river to adopt a definition of light pollution into their zoning regulations. Sort of simple first step, but as it turns out, most towns didn't have even that as, as a basic start. And you know, this came out of a number of years of, of really researching this and trying to understand what is the specific, what are specific aspects of light pollution um, that are problematic for Connecticut River Estuary. So this is a definition that is now in the lighting, in the zoning standards of three member towns. And we're hoping uh, by the end of the year, we'll be in all member towns um, zoning regulations. But you can see we added some things in here um, that you probably won't find in other places, uh, such as including uh, lights that are shown into the water column, the Connecticut River and its tributaries, lighting on residential docks, uplighting of trees and other site features, um, and light trespass onto neighbor properties, including the Connecticut River. So, and of course, um, Alan's uh, very important um, observation of stars and planets. So we worked a lot on this definition. We workshopped it a lot. We sent it out to towns. We got feedback. Um, we think this is a, about as comprehensive as we can get without getting too verbose. Uh, and we're excited that it's being adopted by towns now. And this isn't a standard. We're not requiring lumen limits. We're not requiring types of fixtures, but it's a leg for towns to stand on should they choose to go further in their own ordinances and regulations and adopt some of those things. Um, so the next thing that we did is, those of you who live along the river and the gateway zone may know that um, if there is a house that is being built or any building that's being built over 4,000 square feet that's along the river, uh, it has to go through a special site plan, special permit review. Um, and during that review, the Gateway Commission actually has a chance to, to comment on the project. And also the zoning board of the town will have a chance to review it um, and give feedback. And one of the things written into the Gateway Zoning Standards, uh, we have this list of criteria. So some of these criteria are things like, you know, the massing shouldn't be too out of keeping with the site. You know, the, the house shouldn't have, uh, it shouldn't be over a certain height. Uh, it should respect the natural topography. All those things uh, are nine standards that we've, we've had for many, many years. So this is one new review standard that we've added, again, only for houses that are over 4,000 square feet. So not everything in the gateway zone, not renovations. Well, if renovations make the house bigger than 4,000, those are included too, but, um, Otherwise, and again, it's not a hard and fast rule. Um, it's simply a way to say, let's consider this as part of the conversation. So that an applicant, when they bring their plans uh, and you know, how they're gonna deal with trees and uh, site drainage, they bring all that for the Zoning Commission and for the Gateway Commission to look at, they also have to show us how they're addressing light pollution. And that's essentially what this standard does. Um, so ideally, hopefully what we'll be seeing in the future from people who wanna build big houses on the river is an explanation of where these lights are, um, you know, how bright they are, some sense of um, the shapes of the light they're casting, and then we can review and figure out, you know, is that consistent with our 
um, aim to decrease light pollution as it's defined in the zoning rules. So those are sort of the three avenues that we at Gateway have taken. Um, the first one, you know, was the beginning of my presentation and what Ellen is doing. And I think why we're here tonight is education, trying to get people to learn more about the issue, why it's so important and what they can do on their own. Because, you know, regulating this is not really going to solve the issue. Um, you know, it's, it's thousands and thousands of light bulbs and light fixtures. It's really about everybody becoming aware of this and thinking, you know, if we all work together, we could actually see some more planets and maybe we can see the Milky Way on more nights. Um, and we'll have that connection and the wildlife that, you know, we all love and live next to will, will also thrive better. Um, so the gateway standards uh, are, is the language I just showed. And then town ordinances uh, are something that I encourage all of us to ask our uh, legislators, um, ask our first selectmen um, about um, whether there's something that we could adopt in our towns. Uh, as gateway, we haven't had the power to do that, but as I said, Westbrook has done it. Um, I think uh, Lyme has adopted some lighting standards. Um, and that model lighting ordinance is, is really a great jumping off point. And Gateway has actually developed some model language that we encourage towns along the river to adopt and look into that we're sending to uh, zoning boards. So hopefully between these three things, um, we'll try and address this issue in our little corner of the world and uh, try and keep our donut hole a good place for Alan to do his observations. So um, thanks everyone for, for listening and we have time for lots of questions.